please take a second to subscribe, then like and share afterwards. We can really use your support. Thank you. In the previous episode, we tied up the meaning behind the plague, and as a forerunner, brought about the very first Passover that points us to the sacrificial lamb that brings us salvation. If you can recall, back at the beginning of episode 7, we promised we would return to the mystery of the Jubilee. Well, we are almost there. And to get there, we must first pass through the Dark Jubilee and the Awakening Dragon. Behind everything that we've seen, all the Jubilean manifestations, lies a mystery that binds them all together. It is the answer to the Jubilee itself. You see, the Jubilee undoes the loss of the ancestral possession, the land of Israel and Jerusalem. And here it is. The destruction of Israel and the scattering of the people did not start in 70 AD. The sequence of events first started in 66 AD, when the Jewish people in Judea revolted against Roman rule. In response, the Roman governor Cestius Gallus invaded the land to end the revolt. They attempted a nine-day siege of Jerusalem, but it only ended in failure. Gallus withdrew his army, but then the troops were ambushed and suffered a heavy loss. The Roman forces were driven out. It was then that the Roman Emperor Nero sent one of his generals, Vespasian, to crush the revolt. Vespasian entered the land and obliterated the Jewish strongholds and began decimating the population. This invasion and campaign to expel the Jewish people actually began in 67 AD. It was this event in 67 AD that would determine the timing of everything else to follow. You see, when we add a jubilee in 50 years to 67, it brings us to 117. The 50-year cycles set a marker for the jubilee mystery to determine the years of restoration ending in 67 and 17. This repeats every century. This is why, when we began this series in Episode 1, The Return of Israel, the mystery begins with the appearance of the stranger and the man with the measuring line converging in 1867. Recall, the year when the land was transferred for the last time before the time of restoration was when it passed to the Ottoman Empire, was in 1517 the 29th Jubilee from the year of Vespasian's invasion, and the year when the promise of a national homeland was given to the Jewish people was in 1917, the 37th Jubilee. We follow this all the way up to the major world power that restored legal sanction to Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel in 2017, the 39th Jubilee from the year of the Roman invasion. There is a deep dimension to the word and the mystery. According to the ancient covenant, if the people of Israel remained joined to God, they would remain joined to the land. But if they departed from God, they would be departed from the land. The physical realm was bound to the spiritual. The physical is a manifestation of the spiritual but written in the same covenant and foretold by the prophets was that a return to God would lead to a return to the land. It goes both ways. In Hebrew, the word tashuvu means you shall return. However, it also means to repent. God was sure that this point was made in the language. The same word for return also means repent. Therefore, if the people were scattered across the face of the earth, that means that there had to have been a spiritual departure from God so colossal to warrant such a departure from the land. But it was foretold by Hosea 
that there would be a spiritual return to God. The children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. Hosea 3, 4-5 So according to the prophecy, the people would be separated from David their king. Interestingly, David had been dead for centuries by the time Hosea wrote it. But the name of David was used by the prophets to speak of the Messiah, the royal descendant of King David. So, to return to the Messiah, they first have to leave the Messiah. Because you can only return to what you first left, left or departed. Therefore, this mystery is pointing us to a spiritual departure. It took place around the same time of the physical departure when the Jewish people left the land, in the first century. So, what major event took place within the first century that was spiritual involving the people and the land? Jesus. Christianity may be foreign to the Jewish people today, but it only is because it became foreign, because it was departed from. Christianity and Judaism became two separate faiths because of this departure, but they really ought to be just one. Christianity was and will always be a Jewish faith and now under a new covenant. In the Hebrew scriptures, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem, ride a donkey into Jerusalem, be rejected, scourged, beaten, and delivered to death as a lamb to the slaughter, and give his life as a sacrifice for sin. He would overcome death to bring redemption, forgiveness, and salvation to all who receive it. Micah 5.2 Zechariah 9.9 9, Psalm 118.22 Isaiah 53.3 to 12. And all this had to take place before the destruction of the second temple. In other words, before the year 70 AD. Jesus is the only one it describes, no one else. And his first name, Yeshua, just happens to mean salvation. The Jewish people mostly did not accept him, hence the departure. But those who are not of Israel did accept him, which was prophesied. The Jewish Messiah would become the light to the Gentiles. But a small minority of Jewish people were the first believers, the first disciples, and the immediate ones that followed. It was these who gave to the world this faith, and by doing so would change the course of human history. They would bring the light to the nations, to give the word of God to the world, and bring salvation to the ends of the earth. After the first century, those Jewish apostles, disciples, and early believers began disappearing. Their disappearance would seal the separation between the Jewish people and their Messiah. The rejection of Jesus Christ was their spiritual departure and the estrangement from the land of Israel would be the physical. But with the Jubilee, it is about ending the separation. Now we have seen the completion of the return to the land of their ancestral position. What about the spiritual return and when? This is the final door that we need to enter, this missing piece of the final puzzle. As we have seen in the Law of Reversal of Restoration, we can expect that the spiritual return will come in stages like what we've seen in the physical. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul writes of the faith as an olive tree, an olive tree linked to the Jewish people, but to which the Gentiles were now being grafted in. But he adds that the Jewish people, the natural branches, though separated from the tree, will, in the end, be grafted back in and reattached. 
Everything returns to how it originally was. But not all returns are positive. By nature, it brings us to a jubilee unlike any other. It is the Dark Jubilee and the awakening of the dragon. The fate of Israel and the fate of the world are bound together. The Jewish nation is a microcosm of the world. So if Israel's destiny is determined by the Jubilean mysteries, so too with the destiny of the world. The mysteries have always involved other nations and people, world events and wars. 2,000 years ago, the center of Western civilization and world history was the Roman Empire. Into that empire came the Messiah and the Gospel. Later, that empire was transformed because of the Gospel, mainly its faith. It would eventually take on the biblical faith and worldview. Eventually, it would define Western civilization and become part of its very culture. Therefore, as the Jewish people returned to their homeland from whence they came, so too would the world return to its original state. And what state was the world in? It would become a state devoid of biblical foundations and alien to Judeo-Christian values and faith. This means that we should be witnessing the departure of Western civilization from its biblical foundation, a departure from spirituality, and especially a departure from morality. Sound familiar? Today we are seeing the very de-Christianization of our culture, the removal of God's word, the overturning of values, the confusing of genders, cancel culture, the increasingly wide acceptance of debasement, promiscuity, and every type of inversion we can think of. And it has only begun. As Rome was a pagan culture, so too will Western civilization become pagan, in a modern sense. Today, we are seeing that paganism come out of a progressive, secular, enlightened, and revolutionary foundation. In the pagan world, of the first century, children were killed in their mother's wombs, and we have quickly embraced this pagan practice. The same too with other pagan views concerning sexuality, gender, and issues with marriage as we've seen. It is difficult to comprehend, but in the first century days, it was anti-Christian as what we've seen in the book of Acts. It warred against faith and persecuted those who upheld it. Therefore, apart from divine intervention, our civilization will increasingly war against the faith and the word of God. God's people will become marginalized, delegitimized, ridiculed, vilified, and finally persecuted. A return to Rome. And likewise, the Western world will become anti-Israel. The scriptures prophesy that in the end times, the issue of Israel and Jerusalem will be the center of world controversy, and the nations will gather to war against them. It is the dark return. But is there anything good that comes out of all this? Most certainly. As recorded in the book of Acts, this radical new Christian movement was revolutionary. It had no government sanction, no cultural support, no earthly resources. With only the power of the Holy Spirit, it turned the status quo on its head. It was contrary to the world, and within a few centuries, it took over the Western world all derived from the very moment that Jesus stood with his followers and commanded to take the good news to the entire world. When that spreading took hold, the branches of Judaism became increasingly estranged from its roots and the roots from its branches. With Jerusalem destroyed and its people scattered, the church began to lose its connection to Israel and its Jewish ancestral heritage. As it merged with the rest of the world, it began losing its revolutionary power 
and that original fire died down and became weakened. The church, although still alive in many areas, found itself in exile. It paralleled the exile of the Jewish people. You see, the church is an Israel in spirit. They are bound together. When one departs, so does the other. But the mystery of the Jubilee ordains. Each shall return to his own possession. That means the church must also return. If Israel comes home, so too must the church. So too must come the faith. The two departed together in the beginning, and so together they must return in the end. Up next, we arrive at the promised Jubilee of Jubilees, the ultimate Jubilee that brings about the return we've been waiting for. Here on Prophecies Uncovered.